Um, this is the third panel in a series on the future of the humanities and social sciences. And um, to just give you a quick reminder of the series, the first panel was um, Rethinking the Sciences and Letters Divide. The second was the humanities and social sciences going forward. Both of these were uh, done in Japanese. And they are already published on our YouTube channel. So if you want to check them out later, um, if you haven't, haven't joined us for, for these, um, please feel free to do so. And today's, channel, uh, today's panel is on the future of the humanities and social sciences perspectives from the sociology of knowledge. And I just want to quickly introduce the idea of and how it relates to the other two panels. So the perspective of the first panel was basically, um, if you will, um, the perspective of researchers working in a discipline, working in a uh, humanities and social sciences discipline, but also um, like professors joined us from the sciences disciplines. So, and if you, the perspective was about the conceptual and methodological shifts in these disciplines, uh, we had a bit of an abstract discussion of what is Bunke and Rike, what is, uh, what are the letters and the sciences and what kind of definitions and classifications of scholarship can we have and should we have. And the second panel was kind of from the perspective of members of an academic institution, members of the Tokyo University. Um, so, and the topic was mostly focused on the issue of institutional reform. So how do we um, um, want to uh, reform un uh, universities so that the humanities and social sciences can play um, a proactive role? And here um, the local focus or the spatial focus was of course the University of Tokyo. Um, as the original initiative for this series was also uh, 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 the, a working paper that was, uh, or the report of a working group on uh, reform of uh, the humanities and social sciences at the University of Tokyo. And the second focus, of course, was also in Japan, the relationship of the universities to the government. Um, so, and this is why we are having a third panel that kind of opens up um, the perspective a bit more so this time we are all wearing the hat of researchers of knowledge systems, right? Of course, we are also members of universities. We are also working in disciplines, but this time we have invited uh, colleagues who are studying knowledge systems. Um, and we have invited colleagues also not from outside Japan so that we can discuss a bit um, a global perspective on these issues and also people working on the past, the present and the future of knowledge systems so that we can discuss a bit of uh, the long-term knowledge change that is happening. Um, so today's panel will uh, start by having introductory pitches by our panelists, five to 10 minutes each. And then we have initial responses um, and a discussion around the, uh, these um, initial presentations. And then I will introduce one or two concerns from the previous panel to make a bit of a, an explicit connection. And then we'll continue with a free discussion. So uh, in contrast to the previous sessions, this time we also activated the Q&A function because we also want to hear from your side since this is the last panel of the series. So questions and comments from the audience from you are very welcome. And you can just click on the Q&A button on the, in the menu, in the Zoom menu. Uh, and to use the chat function to write something. Of course, we will not be able to pick up every question and I would ask you for your understanding for that, but we try to pick up some of the, um, some of your comments uh, and see how we can uh, discuss them and answer them. So um, I'm going to be the moderator for today's panel. My name is Michael Fatsis. I'm associate professor here at Tokyo College. I'm working myself on the history of knowledge uh, and the history of translation focusing on Japan in regional and global contexts. And I have written uh, a monograph on the transformation of Chinese knowledge in Japan in the 19th century in the context of globalization. So these are today's panelists. They will introduce themselves in their, um, in their introductory uh, pitches, but uh, let me briefly um, like introduce them by name and their title. So first uh, we have Professor Nakajima Takagiro, who is the director of the East Asian Academy for New Liberal Arts here at the University of Tokyo. Secondly, we have Professor uh, Kerstin Kuhls, who is a scientific project manager at the Fraunhofer Institute for Systems and Innovation Research in Karlsruhe, Germany, and a professor at the University of Heidelberg. And thirdly, we have uh, Nana Hamati Ataya, who is the founding director of the Center for Global Knowledge Studies at uh, Cambridge University. 
Then we have um, Professor Liao Meijun, who is Assistant Professor at the Institute for Global Public Policy at Fudan University. And last but not least, uh, our own uh, Wang Wenlu, who is a project researcher here at uh, Tokyo College. And with that, I would like to, to start our initial round and ask Professor Nakajima um, to start. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you so much, <clears throat> Mihael, for your kind introduction. Um, I am Takahiro Nakajima, director of uh, EAA, and that means East Asian Academy for New Liberal Arts. This is a brand new project. So I'd like to share my PowerPoint with you. Okay. So can you see this? Okay. Okay. So <clears throat> who teaches what to who? This is a very uh, tricky uh, <clears throat> title to you. Perspectives from the sociology of knowledge. Th this, this is our uh, common topic. So I intentionally choose this title, who teaches what to who. Okay, so next. When considering a new platform for higher education, the question of who teaches who will become an important issue in the future. Until now, faculty members of a certain university have taught students enrolled in that university. It is, so to speak, enclosing knowledge. However, with the advance of globalization and information technology, it is clear that such a model is becoming unsustainable, not to mention the example of the Minerva project. Yeah, all of you might know this project. So what should be done about the traditional universities that have been providing high quality education? There have been various attempts to do so over the years, but I'd like to discuss here uh, our challenge of the East Asian Academy of New Liberal Arts, EAA. From the, from the beginning, the EAA was conceived as a <clears throat> platform for research and education centered on PKU, Peking University and the University of Tokyo with faculty members from both universities providing liberal arts education to students from both universities across national borders. In other words, instead of faculty members from the University of Tokyo teaching students from the University of Tokyo, the idea was to have faculty members from PKU and U Tokyo teaching students from PKU and the University of Tokyo. You can see that this is fundamentally different from a dual degree or double degree in terms of institutional design. It is an attempt to change the shape of higher education through cooperation between two leading universities in two different countries on the trust on the academism. So <clears throat> this is a photo from Summer Institute 2019 at PKU. I, gave some you know, uh, <clears throat> talk to the PKU and the uh, <clears throat> Utopia students here at PKU. Moreover, the EAA is collaborating with the ANU, Australian National University, NYU, New York University, and the Uni University of Bonn under the Winter Institute program to support doctoral students and young postdoc researchers. What is needed is a new international platform for higher education, where cutting edge knowledge is brought, up, brought together and students can enjoy the results. So this photo came from Winter Institute 2020 at New York, NYU. How can we analyze this experience from the perspective of the sociology of knowledge? For one thing, cutting edge knowledge is directed to actual issues. For example, there is the issue of the light of discourse, which is an objection to the Western centered discourse in modernity. The EAA discusses this issue from the perspective of world philosophy. This is a brand new project, world literature, 
and world history. <clears throat> I myself <clears throat> am discussing the issue from the perspective of world philosophy. Last year, with three other colleagues, we published a nine volume series of history of world philosophy from Chikuma Shobo. So you can see this photo from Chikuma Shobo. Uh, <clears throat> and this year, we are trying to think more deeply about the significance of world philosophy in EAA based on it. I don't have time to go into uh, details uh, but um, the, the significance of the project of world philosophy lies in uh, one, reviewing the lights of Western centric discourse to finding a way from the particularity of the region to the universal rather than uh, confining oneself to the particularity of the region. And the three, looking at the global circulation of concepts for example, to discuss how much the Neo-Confucian discussion of uh, the, <clears throat> sometimes it is translated into reason, uh, the influenced the European enlightenment and changed the organization of erudition. And conversely, how the modern Euro European concept of reason transformed East Asian discourse. In order to open up such a worldly circulated perspective, it is not enough to have knowledge divided into traditional Chinese philosophy and European Enlightenment philosophy, but it is necess necessary to have an integrated knowledge and engaged reading that crosses them. Secondly, cutting edge knowledge requires a new reading of text and the EAA is committed to a new reading of the classics, especially contemporary classics, a reading that is more engaged and cross-contextual than the traditional 19th century philological reading. For example, in this fall semester, I will be taking up modern classics such as Sufism and Taoism written by Toshihiko Izutsu, in which Izutsu presents a truly unique reading. Philology teaches that the text Dada Jin, Lao Tzu, is a text that has been edited by several people and Izutsu is well aware of this fact, but he tries to read something personal in it. It was an attempt to deconstruct the modern concept of the individual and the subject, inheriting the French sinologist Henri Maspero and American philosopher William James discussion of the mystery that Maspero referred to. The third thing I must point out is that cutting edge knowledge is dialogical. Many EAA classes are taught by more than one faculty member, which means that the structure is based on dialogue between faculty members and the students participate in that dialogue. The idea is to avoid the conventional model of a faculty member who has a dominant monopoly on knowledge and transmits it to students and to seek a more heuristic way of knowledge through dialogue. In the seminar I conducted with Professor Wan Qing the year before last, we took up a text by Jojo Agamben and what we discussed there later showed how heuristic it was to read this in COVID-19 pandemic situation. The above has been a brief introduction to the EAA experience. Based on this, I'd like to look ahead to the future of higher education. There are three important points to be considered. First, Universities will become more a platform for knowledge, which means that they will be responsible for building a platform where faculty and students can come together under some actual questions. It means being constantly aware of what kind of questions to ask, what kind of faculty to bring together. International collaboration will be extremely important in this point and what kind of students to invite to participate. 
it is necessary to constantly renew membership in order to maintain the dynamism of knowledge, rather than simply selecting students through entrance examinations as in the past. It is extremely important to be open to students from other universities with which we collaborate. However, this should not be done ad hoc, but should be well institutionalized and have some degree of constancy. Secondly, universities need to strengthen their international cooperation. In order to do this, the traditional fixed appointments must be made more flexible and the system must be created where multiple appointments are given to outstanding faculty members, even for short periods of time and shared among multiple universities. However, this should not lead to instability in the status of faculty members. So it is desirable to design a system with a strong guarantee of status. This is in direct, this is in direct contrast to the current policy of non-regular employment of researchers in Japan. Thirdly, universities need to work more closely with society. Often we hear people say that the humanities are useless, but in fact, the opposite is true. The humanities play a major role in creating the social imaginary. What is needed is a vision of the kind of desirable society that can be envisioned through the humanities. In order to develop this, cooperation with other sectors of society is essential. For example, the EAA has received support from Daikin Industries, which means that through dialogue with Daikin Industries, we are working together on the economics and the philosophical issue of air as social common capital and, it, and its valuing. There is another example. The new institute in Hamburg is a platform for business person and academics to jointly think about value and values. At the time, when disparity and the environmental distraction caused by capitalism have become conspic conspicuous, it is the responsibility of not only business person, but also academics to change capitalism in a more positive direction. It is very important that the new institute has been established as an attempt to do so. Yes, that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Nakajima Sensei. Let's move right on to uh, Wang Wenlu and her statement. Uh, thank you for welcoming to this panel. Uh, my name is Wang Wenlu, and I'm now a project researcher at Tokyo College. Okay, so uh, my research explores um, the intercultural interaction between Europe and East Asia from the 16th to, 17th, uh, to 18th centuries, especially the Chinese translation of Christian doctrine. Um, this interaction mediated by Catholic missionaries has long been viewed and researched as one of the earliest and most significant cultural encounters between the East and West. And in this panel's framework, I want to discuss uh, this encounter as that of two very different knowledge systems uh, from a historical perspective, attempting to historicize the current discussion on communication and collaboration across knowledge systems. Um, conventionally, conventionally, I'm sorry. Conventionally, the focus of this, the focus of scholars in these fields, has been on how Western science, including cartography, mathematics, and astronomy, has transmitted to ancient China. And re but recent scholarship has broadened the range of study in two aspects. First, based on the contemporary meaning of science, scientific knowledge has expanded to include more extensive information and knowledge that traveled across the continent. Second, there is more literature now on the process in both directions. That is knowledge transmitted to and from both China and Europe. Through numerous translated works, missionaries correspondence and edited volumes, knowledge of the Chinese language, Chinese history, Confucianism, Chinese music, 
etc., were introduced to the European scholarly circle and became part of the contemporary discussion on universal language, universal history, and science. Meanwhile, European philosophy, at the time, an umbrella term for studies of logic, um, physics, metaphysics, mathematics, including arithmetic, arithmetic, ge geometry, music, astronomy, and ethics, at that time, was rendered in Chinese through the collaboration of Jesuits and Chinese literati. This new set of knowledge and methodology of the Jesuit tradition is believed to have later impacted the late Qing scholarship greatly. Communication knowledge transmission between Europe and Minqing China were, facilita was, were facilitated through translation with missionaries mediation at both ends. As a distinct set of fundamental concepts supported both knowledge systems. The translation process started from these fundamental ideas. Most important concepts intru introduced by the missionaries were translated after consultation with the literati into Confucian terms. For example, philosophy for the, Jesuit, for the Jesuits at that time meant systematic knowledge of the physical world created by God. Studying and appreciating the book of nature serve as a means to understand God. This concept was translated into Chinese as the study of Gu Wu, literally means investigating things and exhaustively phantoming, which in the Confucian context is centrally situated in the ep epistemology of literati classical learning with the goal of searching for the ultimate principle. The correlation of the meaning of the two concepts can be drawn because the natural studies introduced by the Jesuits resonated with Chinese literati's long-standing interest in natural phenomena. Besides, the ideas of reason and the rational soul crucial to the Christian faith was expressed in various Confucian terms, including Ling Huan, Ling Xing, Ling Cai and liang zhi, liang neng, etc. Moreover, love for the Christian God was also once translated into the Confucian term learn, uh, the Confucian term ren, literally means benevolence, but it only appears in very few texts. In these translations, we observe a superimposition of the two very different system, two very different knowledge systems. For the Chinese literati, this was a natural choice for understanding unfamiliar ideas. For the missionaries, it was a strategic choice to attract the literati's attention. The process has been described by scholars as neutral appropriation. Importantly, the disadvantage of this simple syncretization is that Original meanings faced the threat of, of obscurity, which did become problematic uh, later on and has generated much opposition uh, from the other orders and controversies. However, the act of translating and retranslating has resulted in many more works, um, both in European languages and also in the Chinese languages attempting to provide further explanations, new questions have been posted for all, and is generating more debate and discussion. I believe that encounters between different knowledge systems in history, like the ones in my research, can offer reference points for the dialogue and collaboration we aspire today, be it the collaboration between arts and science, among academia, where research is conducted on different languages and rooted in various cultural and institutional traditions, or even in dialogue between modern and historical scholarship. Considering the future of humanities, two key words emerging from our previous panels are globalization or inter internationalization and interdisciplinary collaboration. 
I believe there are many paths leading to these goals. However, from the intercultural encounters between mainstream China and Europe, we can say the act of translating and the role of intermediaries, in this case missionaries, are vital. I'm not talking about the large scale word-to-word -word translation of languages. Many humanities researchers have already highlighted its ineffectiveness and problems. From today's discussion, it is clear that translating practice is, expect is effective only when it is based on a deep understanding of the context. Moreover, it should be viewed as a process of dialoguing rather than a tool leading to a well-defined end. Although the main theme of this series of seminars is the, distinct, is the distinction between arts and human, between um, the humanities and sciences, I believe we should also apply translating practice more broadly among academia of different operating languages, between modern and historical contexts, or between institutions and the lay circle. Another aspect is asking whether we need intermediaries like the missionaries and their Chinese collaborators in the early modern era. If so, who can best fulfill the task? Scholars are actively involved, involved in inter, scholars that have, who have already actively involved in interdisciplinary or international collaborations and scholars working in a field to bring together the arts and sciences, examples of which we have discussed in previous panels, social psychology, studies of science, technology and society, science communication, history of science, et cetera, I believe will probably play an even more significant role in shaping collaborative um, academia. And that's all for me. Uh, that's all for me for now. And thank you for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Wenlu, for your statement. And third is, uh, I think, Inan um, Hamati Ataya. So if we could just move on to your statement. Yes, thank you, Mikael. Thanks uh, for this invitation to participate in this um, important discussion about uh, our fields of study. Um, my short intervention is going to focus on the changing structure of global knowledge that the humanities and social sciences operate in and um, the implications that I believe this has for the future of our disciplines and for their wider intellectual and social role. So let me start by stating an obvious but important fact, namely that the humanities and social sciences are themselves part of the knowledge systems uh, that some of us study. And so before we can examine the present and future of our disciplines, we need to understand uh, this dual positionality or status of subject and object, and specifically understand uh, and assess the optimal conditions for the deployment of this positionality in a way that serves our intellectual as well uh, as social aspirations. The main point that um, I want to make today in relation to the questions that Mikael has um, posed to us is that the transformations of uh, the global knowledge economy will likely soon make it very difficult for our disciplines to effectively mobilize this uh, dual status critically and efficiently, either to better understand current knowledge systems or better serve society. So the case study that I examine in my own research uh, is the evolution of the knowledge systems that have driven the transformation of our agrarian mode of life. And if we step back, and examine this evolution in, in the very long term, say the span of 15,000 years of agricultural knowledges, we can identify very profound um, and very consequential transformations in the way that these knowledges have been produced, especially in the past 200 years. And these implications should concern us as scholars in the humanities and social sciences. So, for example, there is an increased fragmentation and specialization of all the knowledges that constitutes the field of agriculture, 
with a greater role to um, given to scientific and technological innovations, as opposed to what uh, some scholars would call indigenous knowledges and, and, and the practices of actual farmers. And so a corollary of this is, of course, a reduction in the scope and number of social actors that are involved in the process, the marginalization of farmers and their knowledges to the benefit of very particular sectors of society, especially the food industry and a very highly specialized technological sector. The third one, consequently, um, the third trend is the development of political and legal structures and frameworks that increasingly respond to the needs of these actors that are now uh, monopolizing uh, the production of knowledges and technologies uh, for the production of our food systems. And uh, in turn, these political and legal frameworks that are being um, established determine the structural constraints within which knowledge will continue to be produced. So let's remember that we're talking here about the core knowledge systems that we rely on to produce our food systems, which are really the one of the most essential uh, conditions of our survival and, and development. And so the implications of these trends are particularly important. But increasingly, the sectors that are now developing these knowledge systems are also simultaneously leading the global solutions to the global challenges that pertain to food security, but also more generally to climate change. Um, and so all these uh, solutions that are being developed by particular social and economic actors are also expected to solve problems pertaining, for example, to uh, une unequal access to resources and other asymmetries that disproportionately affect societies of the global south and that undermine their future development. So those who hold basically uh, the sources and the means and the legal frameworks to develop these essential agricultural knowledges also hold the key to the major solutions that are going to be deployed in the next decade or so to solve the global challenges that we're facing as a species, as a civilization. In parallel with this evolution, we witness um, a steady shift in the place of the university itself as a center of production of a wide range uh, of knowledge is. It's very likely, for example, that the next agricultural revolution will be led by the industry sector rather than the research uh, centers of universities or philanthropic uh, agencies, as was the case with the previous uh, agricultural revolution of the 20th century. And already the major scientific and technological innovations that are driving the solutions to the global challenges that I just mentioned uh, are driven by startups who are attracting big industry investments, um, a lot of private money, with governments and international agencies um, becoming increasingly dependent on the standards and the structures that these different social actors set. So the marginalization uh, of the university and especially the public research sector poses several substantial problems for all the relevant academic fields, including for the humanities and social sciences that are involved in the study of knowledge systems. Traditionally, historians and sociologists of knowledge and science, for example, have had to develop particular uh, forms of access to the sources of knowledge production within uh, the university and society and develop uh, uh, particular skills to access these other disciplines or social fields. And the evolution of interdisciplinarity, for example, or the reflections on the relation between the academy and society and especially the state has been central in, uh, in this process. I think that uh, we are now at the threshold of a new era that is going to require uh, a recalibration. My basic argument is that the existing structures and inter intellectual sources that we've mobilized so far in the understanding of current knowledge systems um, will very soon no longer be sufficient or adapted to the way that these knowledge systems are evolving. And so we will need not only to rethink the scope and conditions of what we call interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary culture and research, but also consider how the humanities and social sciences can critically but efficiently engage the cross-sectorial structures that are currently involved in the production and management of global knowledge systems. 
And without this recalibration, I think that it is doubtful that the humanities and social sciences can sustain their traditional role and ambition of providing human society with the means to understand itself and its possible future, but also with the means to prepare itself for the coming uh, problems and dilemmas that will confront us. And these will be increasingly social and ethical dilemmas having to do with um, the distribution of knowledge as a public good and having to do also uh, with the ethical and moral choices that confront us and how we will develop the normative and, and moral frameworks to help us develop knowledge itself in such a way that it continues to serve the common good and society rather than just the needs and interests and uh, conceptions and purposes of those who monopolize its production. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, so uh, good afternoon, everyone. So today I'm very glad to be here to um, to discuss with you about the future of the humanity and the social sciences. Uh, I am um, uh, assistant professor from Institute for uh, Global Public Policy and Fudan University, and my research uh, areas include uh, science and technology policy, scientific collaboration, mobility. Uh, especially, I am very interested in how scientific teams are assembled to uh, improve uh, the team performance. So uh, for the first uh, question, I mean, um, for the, uh, I mean, for uh, how would my research uh, fields uh, study the issue of uh, the future of the humanities and the social sciences? So uh, it's, uh, so uh, I'd like to explore this question from uh, uh, from the perspective of internationalization of China's humanities and uh, uh, social sciences. So my um, research in interests include, uh, the first one is uh, the exploration uh, of the status quo of internationalization of China's humanities and the social uh, sciences. The second one is about the reason behind uh, internationalization of China's humanities and the social sciences. The last one is uh, is about uh, how the recent shifts of uh, research evaluation system in China uh, that uh, influence the development of humanities and social sciences in China. Because as you know, in China, um, Actually, many dis the development of many disciplines, including humanity and the social sciences and the natural sciences or engineering, actually, uh, the development of these disciplines are largely determined by national policies. So uh, I think the policy perspective is, uh, is a very important aspect to understand uh, the future of humanities and the social sciences. Okay, so the uh, before we went to the first part of the uh, of my presentation, the most important uh, theme is uh, is what is what is um, internationalization of humanities and social sciences. Um, so from this framework, you could say um, so the meaning of internationalization. Uh, actually could uh, could be summarized into uh, three uh, levels. The first level is uh, from the bottom uh, from the top to the bottom is national level, institutional level and individual level. So this research framework could also be applied to humanities and social sciences. And for example, at the national level, there are uh, various policies and research programs that uh, support scientific uh, research uh, that across international boundaries. And uh, at the institutional level, uh, I mean the university and the uh, research institution. So internationalization can be achieved by publishing uh, uh, research articles in international journals or um, uh, giving lecture to uh, the foreign students and uh, so forth. At the individual level, I mean, um, 
the individual scientists could uh, uh, collaborate with their uh, colleagues abroad to achieve the internationalization. Then as I uh, uh, discussed in the former slide, uh, internationalization, actually the scope of, of it is quite, um, is quite broad. And many aspects of internationalization actually are invisible and uh, um, or it is difficult to capture internationalization uh, due to the lack of data av availability. So in this case, um, we could use uh, scientific publications. So um, how, to under, uh, how to understand uh, uh, internationalization? Um, of China's humanities and social sciences. We could use bibliometrics um, to capture many aspects of internationalization. For example, uh, for the, the cited references could uh, reflect the knowledge base of humanities and social sciences research. Uh, the author's affiliation are listed in uh, scientific research articles could uh, identify uh, the countries where authors are come from. And uh, the citations um, also could reflect uh, international scientific impacts uh, the papers uh, in humanities and social sciences receive. Uh, co-authorship also, uh, if we measure co-authorship, then we could in, uh, investigate the international collaboration in humanities and social sciences. The last one should be the journal information because journal information uh, can uh, reflect uh, at least part, part of scientific strengths of countries. So given uh, the advantages of bibliometrics, so many researchers, uh, including me, uh, are investigating the process that China's humanities and social sciences develop toward internationalization are uh, using bibliometric methods and the data. Uh, most of the uh, current studies actually seek to answer some variants of the research question. Uh, that is, is China becoming a giant in social sciences? So many researchers actually they use uh, bibliometric uh, methods and data to uh, explore the evolution and the citation impact of China's publication activity in humanities and social sciences. And many of them um, make similar conclusions that China has not yet taken off in the internationalization of social uh, sciences. Then from this uh, this plot, we could uh, uh, say, uh, we, we could observe uh, three different evolution uh, periods of mainland China's uh, social sciences research. The first one is the initial phase, uh, then followed by development and uh, relative uh, stability uh, period of, um, of uh, China's humanities and social sciences research. And we, uh, we could observe that international articles actually really occur uh, within a, with a very strong flash to 18 annual growth rate before 19 uh, 98. Then more recently, in the recent two um, development periods, mainland China's researchers have been uh, publishing significantly more articles uh, in international journals, and uh, the growth rates have uh, uh, stabilized, reaching like 20%. Then uh, if you see the next slide, so from this slide, we, uh, we could observe an international comparison between uh, about the global share of social science uh, articles. And uh, you could say the US actually has maintained uh, around the 20% uh, to 80% over the last decades. Uh, however, the world shares of social sciences articles from the uh, UK and Japan have shown a re relatively stable growth. And there is a very dramatic growth in mainland China's share, especially in the last uh, decade. So the above comparison actually indicates a very significant growth of international articles in mainland China's uh, social sciences research, research uh, compared to uh, the other three uh, countries. And this is 
uh, this can be considered as a sign of increasing uh, internationalization. Then this plot actually shows a comparison between China's social science uh, publication in Chinese journals and in international journals. And we could see uh, that um, there is a very decline, uh, is, there is a decline in social science articles um, published in uh, domestic Chinese uh, journals. And uh, we could see the proportion of uh, SSCI articles relative to the uh, total has been increasing over, over time and account for like 40% in 2018. Uh, the next uh, slide uh, shows the increasing propensity of uh, international collaboration uh, when China's humanities and social sciences research uh, develop towards uh, internationalization. Uh, so you could see the rate of uh, internationally collaborated papers actually uh, increased um, first, then keep a very stable uh, rate uh, in this plot. So uh, based on my research uh, interests, uh, in the future, I will uh, um, investigate uh, more about international collaboration uh, in uh, the process of China's humanities and social sciences develop towards uh, uh, internationalization. Uh, the, next, um, the next slide uh, show another uh, characteristics of China's, uh, of internationalization of China's humanities and social sciences. So it, it is the increasing uh, interdisciplinarity. So from this, uh, this plot, you could see uh, the very low, low uh, index of Chinese, artic uh, Chinese articles and uh, uh, English articles in China's humanities and social sciences uh, from 1998 to 2014. So uh, in this paper, we use a uh, very low index to measure uh, the, degree of, uh, to the degree of interdisciplinarity in uh, humanities and social sciences research articles. And we found that uh, in the study period, uh, the uh, social sciences papers actually has witnessed a slight increase in, inter uh, in interdisciplinarity. And uh, uh, the growth for the humanities actually are more uh, are sharper uh, than that in uh, social sciences. So, uh, the second aspect is about the interdisciplinarity of humanities and social sciences. So uh, th this would be my uh, research focus uh, for the future study to investigate how uh, scientific teams in humanities and social sciences are assemble to improve uh, the team's uh, research uh, performance. Uh, so there are many characteristics or contributes uh, or attributes of team members could be considered. For example, the gender, uh, discipline, affiliation, also country. Uh, all of these, uh, I mean, uh, uh, attributes could be considered in a uh, team assembly to investigate how team uh, are assembled to um, increase uh, the team performance and uh, success in humanities and social sciences. Uh, if you see uh, the next slide, slide. Uh, then uh, this plot uh, indicate also uh, provide evidence about the increasing uh, interdisciplinarity of uh, humanities and social sciences internationalization in China. So from this pr plot, you could say regardless of Chinese articles and English articles. Um, so the interdisciplinarity of subdisciplines in humanities and social sciences increased during the uh, study period. Um, the next uh, slide uh, show the relationship between uh, interdisciplinarity and uh, uh, paper citation. Uh, from the theory of uh, knowledge recombination, uh, more distant elements of knowledge uh, could be combined to produce more innovative um, scientific breakthrough. But in this uh, study, uh, we, um, we 
did an um, investigation on uh, China's humanities and the social sciences uh, research articles, we found that the relationship is not a simply positive relationship, but it's an inverted U-shape uh, association, which means that if uh, researchers in humanities and social sciences, they cite a very high proportion of uh, references from uh, hard science, for example, natural science, engineering, or agriculture to their humanities and social sciences research, their uh, papers, citations will be hampered. So uh, this, uh, this uh, research results imply that uh, the interdisciplinarity could be a double-edged sword for uh, paper citation or paper scientific impacts in humanities and social sciences. Uh, so the next uh, slide um, uh, indicates the striking difference in the degree of internationalization between humanities and social sciences and natural sciences. So this could be an in, uh, interesting uh, research direction for me to investigate the, the reasons or the current development and uh, so forth. Um, uh, the next uh, slide uh, show the evidence about the striking uh, uh, differences. Uh, then we could go to the next one. Okay, so this plot also provides some empirical evidence about the striking uh, difference. Uh, then we uh, go to the second part of uh, my presentation. So it's the reasons behind internationalization of China's humanities and uh, social sciences. So as you can see from the next uh, slide, there are several reasons. Uh, most of them actually are uh, based uh, more about national policy. I mean, uh, more uh, about the policy um, factors. The first one is a national policy and capital investment. So the research funding and research evaluation system in China. The last one is the individual uh, incentives. So if you see uh, the next uh, slide, uh, you could see that actually in China, the development of uh, humanities and social sciences are largely depend, uh, determined by national policy. Uh, so uh, seems uh, the um, 21st century, uh, there is a series of policy that promotes uh, uh, the development of China's humanities and the social sciences. So this is the most important reason for uh, the uh, internationalization of China's humanities and the social sciences. The second uh, reason is about the re research funding. So uh, it's also the very important public resources for uh, scientific development and uh, internationalization. The third one is uh, China's research evaluation policies and the monetary reward system. Uh, so uh, because of the current research evaluation policies, um, uh, researchers in Chinese university uh, tend to publish their uh, humanities and social sciences research in international uh, journals. The last one is researchers' willingness uh, to uh, publish uh, their uh, articles in international journals to promote their scientific impacts abroad. Uh, the next uh, slide show a series of policies um, to promote China's humanities and social sciences. And uh, the next one, uh, if you can see, um, it indicates the increasing um, uh, R&D uh, in China's, um, and uh, you could say uh, after 2007, actually there is a very sharp increase uh, in China's R&D uh, investment. Uh, so the next uh, slide, oh, I will uh, make a conclusion with some recent uh, shifts of research evaluation in China. So now uh, two government documents were issued to shift the evaluation of uh, scientific research and higher education from quantity-oriented uh, to quality-oriented criteria. Uh, in, the, in the context of these new policies, actually um, China is shifting the focus from international publications as 
assessment criteria. Uh, one of these documents defines three types of high quality uh, publications, including as a first priority, a list of Chinese domestic journals. Uh, so this means that, um, um, this mean that uh, probably in the future, uh, researchers in humanities and social sciences in China, uh, they will, I mean, change their propensity of publishing their articles in international journals. Uh, probably they will um, choose to publish their uh, research articles in domestic uh, journals. But there are still some challenges uh, researchers face um, when they publish in domestic uh, journal. For example, uh, there is lack of effective peer uh, review in domestic journals and uh, uh, people should uh, pay uh, some money uh, for publishing their articles in domestic journals. So it's not friendly to uh, students and also junior um, researchers. So in the context of new policy in China, hopefully uh, localized uh, localization and internationalization of China's humanities and social sciences will not be seen as opposed to each other. So that's it. Thank you. And with this, we move on to our last presentation for today uh, by Professor Kunz before starting our discussion. Yes, hello everyone. I tried to share my screen, but it's not so important. So if it does not work, no problem at all, oh, it works. Um, I'm, my name is Kerstin Kuhls. I'm from the Fraunhofer Institute for Systems and Innovation Research. That means we are a non-profit uh, organization, research organization, and we, work, we are working on project basis. And on this basis, I will figure out a little bit of futures that we had or that we can bring in from several projects and especially from one that we have performed um, on the behalf of the European Commission um, that is called post-COVID scenarios, post-COVID-19 scenarios with the assumption that the pandemic is over somehow in 2014. Um, I'm also working at the Heidelberg University uniting East Asian studies, so Japanology, Chinese studies and others um, with foresight. And this is very important to know that foresight is not just an outlook. It's not predicting the future or the futures. It's really working with different futures and making them possible. And the knowledge, our knowledge systems are part of these futures. And um, this is what we are talking about um, here. Uh, knowledge was and is still a means of power. So who has the knowledge may have the power. It is not anymore who has the information has the power. In former times, it was more that um, having some information, this was really important. But now um, it is more important to make something out of it, to make a kind of knowledge out of those information overflood to flow in all these information. And it's not enough to have just a publication made out of it. It's um, very important to collaborate and it's very important to bring it on the next level. But uh, we discussed a lot um, with the commission scenarios and also with other scenarios from the Rathenau Institute. Um, what does that mean for science, for knowledge generation and for our knowledge system? Um, and one, has, one needs to know that open science, so being open in knowledge systems, being open in science is very high on the European Commission's agenda, but that, may, that does not mean that it's equal everywhere. It does not mean that it is linked to all countries of the world, and it does not mean um, that the future is really clear on how open these science systems are. So they can be very different. And uh, we know that um, the systems are not open for all students and for all researchers in all parts of the world. For example, Japan is relatively closed. Um, other countries have administrative barriers. Um, there's always the language barrier. Um, there's sometimes the cultural barrier. And uh, we have to see our knowledge create our knowledge. We have heard that already in one of the presentations here um, in the context of the system. And language does not make sense. Only learning the language does not make sense there. 
So it is a political issue, and it's also more and more an economic issue, knowledge creation and gaining information. Access to information is more and more sold. It's more and more a matter of companies. And in one of our scenarios, we had five scenarios, five different worlds for the European Union. Uh, in one of the worlds, the companies took over and they took over the schooling systems and the university systems. So what if they take over? What about the humanities? The humanities are needed. We have heard that also companies are very interested in them, in values, in ethical discussions, in dialogues, in um, figuring out the dilemmas we are in. Uh, that is very, very important. But in this case, what does that mean? If companies really take over the whole system, if they provide teaching, if teaching is sold, if teaching is so expensive that we have no equality in getting um, access to knowledge or to information. So this is, um, this is one of the parts of the, of the question. Then the question is, of course, shall we collaborate or not? Some countries do not want to collaborate because they want to own their own knowledge. They close the borders, they even close their internets. Who are the owners of the knowledge? What are IPR rights in the future? They will develop in a different way. So the current systems are not sufficient, especially not for the humanities. What does it mean to own knowledge in, this, in the humanities? And um, who are dropping out there? And how to enter a country's knowledge system when there are these barriers again? Um, another question is also how to make use of scientific knowledge. Um, having a Nobel Prize is fine, but not enough. Writing a paper, publish, is fine, but not enough. Then the discussion is not going on and the knowledge is not shuffled or hovered to the next level and to collaborate um, uh, there. We need interdisciplinary discussions, interdisciplinary work in a scientific way. And we need platforms for that. But we have heard the, the notions of transfer of knowledge, bringing knowledge from A to B. That's not the question anymore. The question now today is how to collaborate on generating knowledge, especially in the humanities. How can we jointly for a global knowledge base or for global values collaborate in uh, jointly developing new knowledge, jointly gaining new net knowledge, and again, neglecting those information that are noise, that are not that are just useless, and to identify what is useless and what is really useful. So we need this kind of collaboration will on the policy level, on the economic level, and of course, on the individual level, the researchers who really have to do that. And they really need the skills also um, to work in this intercultural context to understand each other. Again, language barriers. Um, and I see the role of schools and universities that are now really in question. They are changing. They will change very quickly in the next few years um, because the public budgets are empty. And um, we will really get new systems in many countries we are talking about. In Japan, of course, um, education is already expensive. And we see that in China too, that it's getting more and more expensive. And we see that also in Europe now, nowadays, where normal education was free, especially in Germany, but that is also changing. And that also means that humanities are in danger of being forgotten on the one hand, because they are not um, so economically valued, or they are just forgotten because they are forgotten. Um, and um, that they are often not anymore in the knowledge system anymore. They are not taught anymore in, in the way they were taught before. And you always need a lot of basic knowledge um, to be on the level to really get into a dialogue with others and into an interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary dialogue. 
Uh, but, and this is my statement, we need that. We need platforms for joint collaboration, for joint understanding and for joint work in social sciences, sociology, value discussions, ethical. We have all the ethical dilemmas, especially starting with digital world, with AI, with artificial intelligence uh, and with other things like that. And we need global directions. So are the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals enough? for gaining these directions. Foresight is often used for an outlook and then having the normative discussion on that, where is our strategy? Where do we want to go? Not only what is possible, what is feasible, but we are also discussing where do we want to go, especially in humanities here. Is that enough? And global problems can only be solved jointly on a global level. So how can we organize that? And how can we, with foresight, help um, in, in these approaches? Until now, there is no institution um, that is completely linked um, to that. So we work in the different countries, we work on EU level, uh, we work with companies, but um, there is no instance um, to collaborate. So we need a kind of platform for that too. Uh, this is my statement. Otherwise, you have a lot of questions left. Thank you very much, everyone, for your um, stimulating statements and discussions. Um, and I think they already show how many different perspectives um, the, the study of knowledge, be it the sociology of knowledge or the history of knowledge, um, has on the issue of where the humanities were, are, and maybe are going to be at. Um, so first of all, before we, I have a lot of topics that I could discuss with you. But first of all, I wanted to see if you have any immediate responses to each other, any questions that you have, uh, anything that you want to follow up on. If so, um, just speak up. Um, you're totally free to just do so. May I? Of course. Please. Yeah. So I'd like to ask a um, very simple question to Wang Wenlu. Right? According to um, Charles Taylor, uh, the uh, <clears throat> ideal fi figure of much culturalism is Matthew Rich, right? So Matthew Rich is one, one of the uh, representative of uh, transcultural uh, super imposing in imposition of knowledge, right? So how can we imagine Matthew Rich, in this current situation, now that's my uh, question to you. Shall I go ahead? To okay, um, yes. thank you for your question. And because we have limited time, I, I can only respond very briefly, I guess. Uh, yes, Matteo Ricci has been, um, its name has been on a, a lot of international institutions and has been shaped into a figure, figure of, of the idea, um, uh, presence of, of intercultural relation, uh, intercultural communication. But, um, but a lot of research has also been done um, about how, well, I, I think this is kind of a, a a modern day configuration rather than a real um, image of what, what he was really at at that time. But in asking your question, um, a modern day Matteo Ricci, um, I think first of all, he would be very modest because if you read letters um, from Ricci, that he is actually struggling a lot on a daily basis, struggling in, in the communication um, with literati, with um, his, his um, interlocutors at modern on, on a daily basis. And, and I would say uh, that would be the first um, characteristic. And another is to be open um, to um, new dialogues. He's always searching for, not, not, he, not only him, but I think a lot of missionaries are working um, not only in the 16th century, but in, in the 18th century as well. I think while they have their agenda, we have to admit, but a very important um, task they're doing every day is to be open to talk with people. 
And I think that is something we can learn from um, not only missionaries, but maybe also um, uh, merchants at that time um, in the early modern mayor in the early modern period, whoever travels across the country, whoever travels so far, um, they, they are not having the experience of learning the language beforehand. Um, and that forced them to be open and to be modest in front of the local indigenous people and knowledge. And, and I believe that that is crucial to our modern day collaboration as well. And thank you very much. Thank you. Any other questions from one panelist to the other? Otherwise, I would um, just um, read two quick questions um, about individual presentations before we start the uh, more general discussion. First, there's one by Gabriel Brogini Vargas for Professor Nakajima. Um, so, I think a factual question about. Do you have any plans plans to expand the EAA scheme right now? You have been talking about the University of um, Beijing and the University of Tokyo. And it's just a factual question, I guess, like any plans to expand this a bit more to third countries? And... Yeah, so let me introduce my uh, experience in Burma. Yeah, so some years ago, uh, we were invited to <coughs> visit Yangon University. So when the uh, entrance examination of the university was just restarted, right? We faced a, um, <clears throat> a fresh, fresh person at that time, but um, the philosophy education there was not so much, you know, uh, institutionalized. So we promised you Tokyo would, you know, collaborate together with uh, Yangon Yu, especially the uh, Department of Philosophy. That Department of Philosophy had been a center uh, in the Southeast Asian region, right? So they they could refer to such a uh, you know historical uh, how to say historical inheritance, and at the same time <coughs> we could collaborate together with a. Uh, Japanese uh, experience, then we will create a, a, a new type of, of value in the uh, philosophy education. And uh, from Tokyo, Tokyo side, we can learn something more about the indigenous uh, theory from Yangon University. So this scheme would be uh, available for other, you know, so-called Third countries, universities. That that's my thinking. Thank you. Um, when Lou, I think, has a question for. Yes, thank you. Uh, I have a I have a question for uh, Professor Liu and Professor Kurz, and thank you too for your presentations. Um, so Professor Kurz has um, talked about um, competition and collaboration. And, and, and Professor Liu also um, in, in the conclusion um, uh, talked about um, the, the new trend in, 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 the, in the field of humanities in China. So this is not only a Chinese question or like a, any question. I think it's more related to, I, I'm speaking from the Japanese academia because in the report um, that these series of, of, of seminars is uh, based on, um, there's also a concern that scholars in the humanities are always being trapped in the dilemma that most of their, their works are produced in, in the local language and it has a credit to do, for them to do so. And so you have uh, from the, from the uh, institution and also from the policy level, you have the, the, the um, well, uh, you, you have to, you want to, um, First of all, preserve, you want to preserve your local language, the knowledge in your local language. And then on the other hand, you have internalization, you have collaboration and, and you have competition, like you said, because when these um, when this knowledge system, when this knowledge system, when this scholarship produced in languages other than English, they always strive and to compete and, and with with the academia um, in operating in uh, the English language. 
and and it has a, a potential of resort to nationalism, like gaining more um, like power and right in in the international academia arena. So my question to you too is that how does our future um, research, like future academia or like a future knowledge system, um, address this dilemma between internalization and localization, or or like nationalism, nationalization. views, I, I think that, uh, in, uh, for example, in China, I think we uh, need to keep a balance between uh, publishing in domestic journals and also publishing in international journals. As you mentioned, I mean, uh, all the research in humanities and social sciences actually, uh, uh, it has the nature of localization, right? Because all, many of the research in humanities and the social uh, social sciences, actually, they are, are investigating some uh, phenomenon or um, or some research question which is more related to specific uh, regions or countries. Uh, from my experience, uh, when I submitted some uh, some papers to to some journals uh, I uh, so there are several times that the journals uh, uh, reject uh, rejected my papers and said that our journal um, uh, I, I mean uh, th their journals uh, do not uh, accept uh, some research uh, which is very uh, localized. So this, uh, I mean, this is kind of a taste of some international journals. Uh, in, the, in this case, probably uh, it, um, it could be more uh, appropriate for researchers in humanities and social sciences um, to submit uh, or publish our uh, research papers in uh, domestic journals I mean, because uh, the I mean, for the audience, they uh, they re who read domestic journals might be more interested in uh, these uh, research topics rather than international audience. Um, and but for the international journals, I, I think uh, publishing in international journals is also very important because um, it can I mean broaden the scientific impacts of. Uh, Chinese researchers in humanities and social sciences. And uh, there is one, uh, I mean, one target uh, encouraged by our country is that we need to uh, let uh, international audience uh, to know uh, the voice uh, of uh, Chinese researchers, especially in humanities and social sciences, because it's about uh, I mean, it's about the scientific power or the environment of the culture or knowledge uh, uh, at the global scope. So in my opinion is that it's, uh, it is better to keep a balance between publishing in domestic journals and also in international journals. And this is uh, also encouraged by our uh, governments and universities. Thank you. I would like to add that this dilemma, we have this dilemma for a long time already. So English was the predominant language, um, which is also strange even for us, in the, even in the European Union, uh, we had Brexit, we do not have the British in anymore. So why speak English? This was the first question many people asked themselves. Um, but we, and, and the next language in science will be Chinese. Um, but there will always be dominating languages and that means we need to find the balance um, and to make clear that there is a dilemma in that uh, that we need our our languages of our nations to really be very clear in philosophical um, statements in value statements in empirical epistemological uh, work because that can only be um, articulated in the languages that we have. But um, we need more than just the publications. If possible, of course, we should translate these things. And there is good automatic translation already, but we have to adjust it, of course. Uh, the words are often not existing um, to English or to Chinese or to the scientific languages that we have. 
to the larger journals. This is one thing. But the other thing is to really um, exchange on the views. Uh, and this is different from just publications, from just uh, having it on paper or uh, sending it around. This is really to, to struggle about um, the findings that we have. On a, on a higher level and to exchange these views. This can be done on conferences, this can be done on webinars like this, uh, and it can be really also done by doing workshops uh, that are very active and not only talking about this and that and this and that and having statements here and there, but also having a board, for example, and jointly work on how this might unfold or how this is seen or structure it jointly. Um, and this is a completely different way of collaboration that we uh, practice more and more also in foresight to have uh, really joined workshops, um, sometimes with translation, normally without, um, but we, will not overcome this um, language problem. This will remain. We just had a, a project on the futures of lang language learning, and it was clear that we will learn, still have to learn languages in the future, the more the better, but always context-based. And this will help us to collaborate, uh, but this will not do our work in social sciences. Thank you very much. Um, now that we're entering the general discussion, could I ask everyone to um, switch on their screens so that we can facilitate discussion a bit more? Thank you very much. Um, I think this language question is, of course, a perennial one. And like connecting that to um, the presentations of Nakajima Sensei and uh, Ms. Wang, um, I think there's also there's an even more direct connection to like what the humanities are about, right? Um, um, it's a bit different again in the social sciences, perhaps, but um, it's not just this political issue of like the power of the English language and the global market of knowledge, but it's also about translation brings about new knowledge. It brings about knowledge change. It, it, it helps to shift categories. And I think this is something that both Nakajima Sensei and, and Ms. Wang point, pointed out in the presentation. So. Um, it seems like we can't like in the humanities there is no use in like the humanities seem to to an extent to to thrive and need this difference in in language and 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 the effects of translation this is just like a comment based on uh, previous uh, points that were made um i think we have um in our discussion one point that i wanted to um expand a bit on is the, the scale the spatial scales that we are uh, working on and that we have been discussing. We've been discussing the input of, or you have been um, showing us uh, the, 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 the importance of different scales, the regional scale, like in the European Union, or in the case of the EAA, East Asia, or uh, the national scale, as in uh, Professor Liu's presentation, the role of um, the Chinese government in um, developing an agenda for the humanities. Um, but I would start also the very local um, discussions about translation that uh, Ms. Wang uh, discussed. Uh, but perhaps I would um, come back again now to Inanna's uh, role as a director of a global center for knowledge studies, because this is the most um, comprehensive framework, um, the, the global, right? And we, we've been talking in the previous sessions, we've been talking about the humanities as if it was something Japanese. And now we're kind of talking about different versions of the humanities as if they were global to some extent. So I wanted to ask you about, first of all, like what is global knowledge studies? How do you like um, conceptualize global knowledge? And like, what does it mean for like the global humanities? Well, I think we can envisage um, the concept of the global here in two ways. It's uh, the study of global knowledge. So we're talking about systems um, uh, of knowledge that are not uh, locally specific, that are not specific to the particular um, uh, characteristics of a given society, um, but that address uh, global problems. And so the, the knowledge systems have to be adapted in terms of their objects, their methodologies, their temporalities, their perspectives to the, the objects, the globality of the objects themselves. And then there is the notion of deploying a global perspective on knowledge, um, which has been developing for several decades now, um, especially recently with 
a greater sensibility to the asymmetries of knowledge production. So you've been talking about uh, institutions and publications, visibility, languages, etc. But also uh, the structures, the political and normative structures that determine that some societies have access to particular resources, have access to particular uh, logistics that uh, enhance um, the communication of new knowledge, um, uh, of course, the, the funding that is required to develop institutions of learning, of, of research, collaborations, etc. So the knowledge itself is becoming more and more global, also because our uh, existence is becoming much more connected and the problems that we're facing are becoming also much more connected and global. And um, so we need to develop knowledge systems that can respond to these challenges. I think, unfortunately, we no longer have uh, the luxury of specializing into these niche um, specialties, you know, that, I mean, there will always be, hopefully, in the academy, the space for those uh, kinds of specializations, but we are increasingly um, pushed towards, um, uh, you know, collaborations that can bring the most of what the humanities and social sciences can offer to understanding the problems which are very urgent, very pressing, and also trying to find solutions that bring in the wisdom, the accumulated wisdom of the humanities and social sciences, and not just the very technical um, techno solutions that are presented by other uh, sectors. So these two aspects, I think, are, are go hand in hand, because if you do not understand the global deployment of knowledge systems, then it's very difficult then to, to deploy them globally to address global problems. Um, so all of these issues that we've been discussing are very much connected. And I think uh, that one of, the, one of the problems is that we very often focus on how the academy itself is connected and, and how knowledge is circulating within the academy. But we also have to think of how the, the academy itself is inscribed in the larger structures of knowledge production, which are no longer centered on our own institutions, on our own public conception of you know, the public goods, of, of knowledge as a public goods. Um, and so there are levels of complexity, I think, that require uh, the development of a new conception of the disciplines, new humanities, perhaps, uh, a new understanding also of our role. Um, and, and this is quite a challenge. And unfortunately, perhaps also the time that we have to develop these, these new concepts, these new ideas um, is very short. But, but we have to be optimistic. And, and the, the, the positive thing is that the more you understand how knowledge is produced and managed, then the more you can uh, understand or, or shape uh, the more normative aspect of it. And this is where people who study knowledge systems have an, a particularly important role to play in identifying past mistakes, in anticipating the kinds of gaps or um, processes that might be completely, uh, you know, uh, that might undermine future knowledge. Thank you, Thank you very much. Um, and <laughs> um, yeah. So thank you for this contribution. I think this is something we can come back on in a bit, like the, the, the question of, uh, we've been focusing so far and also in the previous panels a bit on the humanities inside academia, but um, I think Inanna has pointed out that in the wider scheme of things, if you consider knowledge systems, it's not just like something self-centered uh, university-based, but like the whole global system of knowledge, then like the role of academia itself and the humanities as a part of academia has, has been changing. Um, let's come back to that in a bit. Um, I also wanted to ask a similar question to Nakajima uh, Sensei as the leader of the EAA. And I wanted to ask you a bit about like the role that East Asia plays in this, why in East Asian liberal arts, like what is, what is the concept of that and how does it relate to the humanities? What's the intention for the future of the humanities or contribution? Yeah, and thank you so much for your very elaborated question. Um, from EAA uh, perspective, you know, we are asked to think of the light of discourse, right? So how can how can East Asia, 
you know, get again the right of discourse uh, apart from the uh, Western, West centered uh, discourses. So right now, there are very strong, you know, phenomena uh, in China uh, advocating Tianxia all under heaven uh, instead of the modern concept of the world, right? So yeah, it, it so it has a, a shadow and light at the same time, right? So <clears throat> we do not go to the um, shadow side that was represented in uh, Japan in the uh, uh, first half of 20th century. So when Japan uh, <clears throat> called itself as the center of the uh, East Asia, right? So <clears throat> that was a misuse of the right of discourse, right? But right now, under this concept of right of uh, discourse, maybe we are asked to universalize our indigenous experiences, right? It is somehow different from globalization of knowledge, right? No, we need a some very critical, you know, process of universalizing in front of the indigenous knowledges. Otherwise, you know, we just you know, reduce something variable from the local knowledge into global, you know, <clears throat> global storage. That, that's a modern type of exploitation, right? So we are <clears throat> criticizing such a system. How can we enrich our, you know, indigenous knowledge system and once again, thinking of universalizing process, which would be shareable with all over the world, all the universities, right? That, that would be one of our important missions in this globalizing era. That, that's my thinking. Thank you very much. So this is again the interplay of the global and local, and instead of assuming like that the global is automatically universal and vice versa, it's like the bottom-up production of knowledge from different areas in the world. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so I wanted to go um, back to the question we had earlier um, about like the role of the university in the wider systems of knowledge that also um, include um, politics that includes states that includes um, companies that includes capitalism in that sense and this is a question that connects to both what we discussed in previous panels and what one of our um, listeners someone in the audience is asking um, this is um, in the first panel we had the discussion about like ways of dividing up knowledge and one way of dividing up knowledge is how compatible it is with global capitalism um, in particular, the idea that knowledge has to produce innovation and be kind of usable, right? And innovation is a keyword that came up here in Professor Kuhl's talk, of course. Um, um, it's also something that has been asked here in the question, uh, the relationship between innovation and academic freedom. Um, so perhaps, it, I have, do you have to say anything about this connection um, in the content or in the context of the future of the humanities? Perhaps Professor Kuhl's first, if you would like to expand a bit on um, this relationship, how you see it in your research and policy um, engagements too. Well, as I'm coming from a from an institute for innovation research, and it's clear that not everything um, needs to end up in a kind of innovation. And we also see innovation as not only something that is new, but also on the market. Um, but coming from the applied sciences, um, this is clear that that we are opting for that. Nevertheless, knowledge production needs to be free. And here I'm completely um, uh, in uh, conforming with our um, constitution saying science shall be free. We also need this kind of basic basic sciences, basic research to really create this kind of knowledge without just pro 
producing something with intention. So we need both. We need a good balance of um, boosting the knowledge as such as it is on a local basis, on a regional basis, on a global basis. Uh, but we also need um, these, these um, levels that are rather application oriented, oriented, but this is sometimes um, exaggerated currently. So sometimes everything needs to have an innovation that is coming out and often it's not an innovation at all. It's, it's even not incremental. It's, uh, it's something that, that is just an add on or has a, a, sp a specific feature. So because it's fashionable, we have a really, um, we have an inflationary use of the word innovation. And if we are a bit stricter there, um, an innovation can also be seen in the knowledge system as such, if we have a different way of producing this kind of knowledge. So um, going back, for example, for the role of the university, uh, university already meant uni, so a lot, the universe. Um, and uh, there we had some structures that uh, limited ourselves. And going then back again from these kind of notions of the different structures of the disciplines to mixing the disciplines or bringing in, to get, bringing in different perspectives. That's what we are doing, for example, in Foresight for looking ahead, uh, having heterogeneous groups from very different perspectives, mixing nano nanotechnology with biotechnology with services or something like that, uh, or bringing in uh, philosophers in a discussion on, I don't know, biotechnology or things like that. That, bring, that really brings new knowledge. And um, what we are observing is most knowledge is really produced at the edges of and at the interfaces of these uh, different, I would not call it disciplines, but um, schools of thought maybe. Uh, and, and there we see uh, the most fruitful parts of our knowledge creation system. Yeah, that's it for me. Thank you very much. Perhaps, uh, Meijin, if you could quickly uh, uh, say something also about, you've been talking about like the strategy of the Chinese government and what role does innovation play for the humanities, right? We have, we see like different in, in these strategies, because we see um, like this going out idea, right? That humanities, Chinese humanities should be sent abroad more actively is what role does innovation play? What kind of ideas are behind this strategy for the humanities specifically? several uh, strategy. I think our government uh, attempt to uh, promote innovation in humanities and social sciences. Uh, so the first one is that uh, actually our government encourage interdisciplinarity uh, in uh, or almost all the disciplines also including humanities and the social sciences. Um, I think in this year, our uh, national natural uh, science foundation they um, so the foundation set a new category for uh, the funding uh, researchers could apply for uh, it is uh, the department of interdisciplinarity uh, I mean uh, before we don't have such a um, category of funding uh, but uh, since this year after uh, these uh, changes and uh, the established of the this new uh, category now um, researchers that um, uh, use more very diverse uh, knowledge or have uh, very diverse in the uh, interdisciplinary skills can uh, write proposal about more interdisciplinary uh, interdisciplinary research question and they could get uh, funding from the government. Uh, so I think this might be a very useful and uh, effective strategy to um, promote innovation in all the disciplines, including humanities and the social sciences. So the second strategy I think should be uh, the encourage of researchers in humanities and social sciences to uh, do some visiting, short visit, academic visiting to other countries. So it could uh, uh, Im uh, improve the international collaboration between Chinese researchers in humanities and the 
social sciences. Also, those in uh, foreign countries such as the U.S., the U.K., and uh, and other European countries. Um, uh, so there, there uh, is there are some studies that uh, found that uh, international collaboration actually could inbreed uh, innovation and uh, innovative ideas in scientific knowledge production. So this could be uh, this could also uh, this could also reflect uh, our government's um, I mean strategy to improve the innovation in humanities and uh, uh, social sciences. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, speaking of innovation, we had one question uh, by uh, some Mr. Abdul Kalam Siddique about uh, the role of technology. Um, so, what is um, do you, so? This is something that we haven't discussed at all, even though it's so um, relevant uh, in the previous two panels. So, I wondered if you have any thoughts on the relationship between the humanities, the developing technology, digital technologies, such as augmented reality and platforms, connected society and so on. Do you, what, what do you see the connection, the contribution, the impact on the humanities of techn recent technological developments? Um, and perhaps- May I? Yeah, Nakaji Masinsa. Yeah, <clears throat> so yeah, very quick. Uh, reply to this wonderful question. I, uh, I'd like to, yeah, ac according to Thomas Kasuris, one of the leading scholars of Japanese uh, philosophy, uh, suggest us two different types of knowledge. One is engaged knowledge, another is detached knowledge. The GAFA type, GAFA type platform always uses this detached knowledge, knowledge is for their, you know, uh, benefit. We may, probably we might call it, it is supporting a surveillance capitalism, but in universities, we do not follow this direction. By using engaged knowledge, we are asked to reflect again and transform such a GAFA type platform and find a, uh, another type of plate or plateau in which uh, <clears throat> we can share our living uh, knowledge, uh, transforming our you know, previous knowledge into the much more you know, uh, universalizing one. That, that's my uh, reply to this question. Thank you very much. Um, Professor Kuhls, do you have anything from your perspective to say about technology and the humanities? Yes, we need the humanities when we are talking about technologies because technologies are um, uh, going beyond the borders that we had until now, the limits. They are they are they are in between humans and technology. They, the the borders are decreasing. This is one one thing that we see. We see it in AI. We see it in robotics. We see it in biotechnology. In the bioeconomy, even even in the products that we are using. Um, and this is for twenty years now a very huge topic. Um, also in in innovation research, uh, where we even had a philosopher in our institute, um, where we are discussing the values behind the ethical issues, um, the moral consequences sometimes, even, even regulation, regulatory consequences, and also um, the, the dilemmas and how to, how to face them and even to work out these dilemmas. Often we are unconscious about that. We don't know them. And uh, we just have a project uh, where we worked on um, the future of environmental issues AI and ethical questions, um, and uh, we even we even in, we involved people from the eth ethics. Um, so uh, the humanities at the University of Tübingen. So they they were really included in the project. We discussed what is lying ahead in AI, but we also discussed later on how can we 
make this visible for normal citizens, for normal people in a kind of narratives or storyboards. And this is where an artist comes in and we are now creating also small storyboards. We call them storyboards and narratives because narratives have a normative touch. We don't want to have a normative touch. We want to show what the dilemma is in. And uh, this is exactly what needs to be published and what needs to be discussed in the public. It's not yet ready. Um, we have two different themes. One is um, what, uh, what happens if AI is used in, a, in robots, in hum humanoid robots in schools for teaching. And one is on uh, what happens if we um, use AI for detecting, exploring and researching deep sea uh, areas that we normally cannot reach as human beings because um, they are too deep for us and they are underwater. Um, and, and there we will have some, some storyboards where we, where we just name these things. And this is just one, one of the examples where humanities can play a huge role uh, in, in detecting the not only challenges lying ahead, but also um, things that have to be regulated, that have, have to be dealt with, uh, that have to be solved technically even in, in, in some cases. Thank you very much. Um, I think we have to uh, slowly move to our last round of um, discussion topics. So um, I wanted to come back a bit to this issue that Inanna has uh, been talking about earlier about the wider role of the humanities, the academic humanities in in uh, knowledge systems. I mean, you have talked about farmers, for example, like there's so many types of knowledges that are not academic knowledges that could be related to the humanities. Um, and of course, there's this power relationship that many of you have been talking about um, and the relation between knowledge and power. And so I wanted to briefly connect this to a, a comment made by uh, I think it was um, Honda Sensei, Honda Yuki Sensei, in, in one of the first discussion rounds um, about the humanities and social sciences and values. So, and she discussed, I hope I'm not misrepresenting what you said, um, that there's a negative correlation in the humanities fields between, so being part of a humanities field and um, attitudes toward um, patriotism, attitudes toward racism, um, attitudes toward um, attitudes toward, um, what was it again? Um, yeah, many uh, uh, merit meritocracy and competition on the market and so on, which means like many people in these fields um, have a negative view towards that, for example, or, um, and that reminded me of this uh, uh, notion of marginalization and the role that humanities are playing and the decreasing funding. I wonder to what extent the humanities are, humanities in, in academia are, are dangerous to some of the knowledge, wider knowledge systems <laughs> that we are working in. And also, um, and then I'll let you, some of you do the final reaction to that. Um, so where are the humanities in, in 100 years going to be at the university even mostly? And if, is that a bad thing? Um, like thinking about, for example, what when do studies in historical, long historical perspectives, the humanities at the university are kind of an exception, right? Often they were at, at temples, at religious institutions, private institutions like the Shu Yuan uh, uh, academies and so on. So mm -hmm. connecting the past and the future with these topics that you brought up. Uh, so what, what <laughs> do you have any comments to either of these two? questions of like the danger of the humanities and the role of the humanities in, fu in the future at university. Um, I think the, the relation, the history of the relation between the humanities and the university itself is um, one central aspect that in the past 150 years, um, the model of the university that has been exported and, and become globalized is very much a model that is, is based on the experience or on the conception of the humanities, of how they conceived of uh, the disciplines and knowledge uh, and their relations, etc. And on top of that um, structure, we've seen um, the added layers that came with the specialization of the sciences and the development of different disciplines. And so I think we're experiencing now a, a very hybrid model of the universities, which are also 
uh, being pulled into different directions. So you have the core of the humanities that uh, essentially carries still a very classical agenda, but that is trying to adapt and trying to uh, make sense of the world and be relevant as a voice, as a distinctive um, voice, either of detachment or of critical engagement with society, uh, trying to maintain a certain uh, critical distance, but at the same time, uh, not be indifferent or, or in a completely uh, aseptic space vis-a-vis uh, -vis what's going on in society. And, and I think depending on the kinds of universities that you're in, you can, you can witness these different layers and these different movements. Uh, so in Cambridge, for example, there are several universities in one uh, where there are many research institutes that are um, sort of independent in, in terms of their funding and in terms of their agenda from the actual university. Uh, but the people circulate uh, and the, the, the public or private sponsors are also involved in very different uh, structures. Uh, the industry is involved in very different ways. And it's very interesting to witness all this and to see the duplication of agendas uh, so you have departments pursuing particular research projects, but you also have research institutes pursuing the same projects, spending the same amount of money on very similar technologies, but for different, you know, with different funding sources. Um, and you wonder how all this is coordinated. On the one hand, I think it's positive because you need different pathways to knowledge. You, you need this openness and diversity because you cannot anticipate which paths are going to lead to what uh, results. But on the other hand, it also feels like a great um, a sort of waste of resources because there is a lack of collaboration. Um, and I think that the humanities and the social sciences have a very interesting role to play in this, um, but not just within the university. And, and perhaps one of the greatest challenges of the future will be to redefine the role and the vocation of the humanities uh, and of the social sciences that are most related to the humanities within the new landscape of knowledge production. And I think that it's a complex issue because we spent decades revisiting the Weberian notion of the vocation of the scholar and our relation uh, to uh, political structures. Um, and now we have to face also the relation to other social actors. And this is a compounded problem. And I think that out of it, and necessarily will come an, a new ethos, perhaps the definition of a new role, uh, but also the acknowledgement, as you said, of the local specificities, of the fact that many knowledge producers uh, who produce uh, philosophical or historical knowledge are not in similar structures everywhere in the world. Not everyone is inscribed in the university structure. Uh, there are some societies where knowledge is produced within the political or journalistic field, within religious institutions, within more traditional institutions. Um, and increasingly, as I said, there are also um, very potent sources uh, of knowledge production and even of you know, the formulation of ethical problems today within uh, the economic sector or within, you know, at the margin or at the interface uh, as uh, as uh, Kirsten was, was saying. So this is, these are all very interesting challenges. And I think that uh, the question is whether someone else will determine how the humanities are inscribed or whether the scholars in the humanities will be able to appropriate this question and shape it themselves and also um, contribute actively and, and, and in interesting ways uh, to how other knowledge producers are facing these problems. Thank you very much. Uh, I think that's a very nice uh, final statement for today's session. Regrettably, we have to wrap up. I think we could continue our discussion for for a long time, uh, but um, time is up for now. So um, thank you very much to all of our panelists for an exciting discussion. Thank you for joining us from four different countries today. And um, thank you to the audience uh, for, for being with us until the end. Uh, and I hope you saw also that um, uh, the humanities, uh, that this kind of this study of knowledge, 
from inside the humanities and social sciences actually, actually contributes to this kind of reflexive capacity um, that is needed in societies and to, to look at knowledge uh, and how knowledge develops is something that um, our vice president said in, in, the, in the second panel that we had. And I think this is a good example of also why the humanities and social sciences are needed to like be on that meta level and look at how knowledge develops. Um, so again, thank you everyone and have a good evening.